going. Howdy folks, this is Joel at Earth Tools and uh, we're going to shoot a little video here about what to expect when you receive your new Grillo G110 walk behind tractor. Uh, Bryce, our new service guy, is running the camera. Hi Bryce. Um, and what we've got here is a G110 Grillo. This one's equipped with a Yamaha engine with electric start on it. It's got the battery here. Um, these also have an option of a Honda engine, but the one we chose for the video just happened to have a Yamaha on it. So, yeah, Yamaha. Um, so this is how your tractor will arrive, although it will be in a box. Uh, the box will be about the shape of the tractor on a pallet. The easiest way to get it out of the box is simply to take a razor blade or a knife, whatever, and slit the corners of the box and fold down one of the side panels and then you just roll the tractor right out. The tractor is typically shipped in, in neutral. Uh, it can't really roll around being it's in a box. So you can just roll it right out. Now to get the handlebars up to a more comfortable position because we've got them oriented pointing straight down for weight or for a space saving, you would use this control here. This is your handlebar height adjustment control. You just push this down, bring the handlebars up, and there's four places which this will lock into position. That's the lowest. Two, three, four. We'll ignore the phone. Somebody else can get that. So anyway, we'll get it up to a position where we can lift it up easily and roll it. Uh, we'll take a look at the transmission selector over here and bring the camera around. So this is your transmission selector lever and uh, an indicator right here. You got one, two, F, three, and four. It's upside down, but you can figure it out, I'm sure. Um, the F is neutral. And as you can see on the G110s, the gear shift is slightly off. It's just the way this transmission got put together on these things. The, the gears don't correspond exactly with where they are, but that is neutral. And I know that because I just rolled the tractor. So this would actually be second. Second is pretty close. Third is, well, usually when the tractor's not running, they don't shift to where those, there's third. So, but we don't need to fool with that much now. As long as it's in neutral, which is that F position, you can roll the tractor, which is the important thing. So you can roll it off the pallet, out of the box, and, uh, you know, commence to getting to know your tractor a little better. So, the, the, the next thing you're probably going to do is want to mount the gear shift rods. There's two rods that come with this thing, uh, which make it a lot easier to shift since you don't want to have to reach down here and shift it all the time. These are zip tied together. Use a knife or whatever to cut them apart. A sharp knife would even be better, but you know, it's not that time of year yet, so I can't sharpen that knife. Uh, so your two shift rods, one of them has the black plastic joint on the bottom of it. The other one does not. That's because the other black plastic joint should be installed here. My warehouse staff usually does that. They might forget occasionally, so if you find both of your shift rods shipped with black plastic joints on a G110 tractor, all you have to do is insert, insert one of them here. There's a little retaining clip that has to come off the top. This is what, what's known as an E-clip. Easiest way to get that off is just pry it off like that, and then this joint can be installed on there. And then this just immediately just push it back on with your thumb. So now, right now the handlebars are in what we call the front PTO position because with the handlebars oriented this way, the PTO of the tractor where the implement hooks on is in the front. So this is how you would run mowers, uh, chipper shredders, snow blowers, hay balers, anything that mounts out the front. If you're wanting to run soil working implements, such as tillers, rotary plows, harrows, and such, you would turn the handlebars around so that your PTO is in the rear and your engine's out front. That way, as, you, as the tractor goes forward, the implement is erasing the tire tracks. Uh, but I'm going to go ahead and mount these shift rods in this position now, because we've got the handlebars there already. So I'm going to pull off the little clip and washer there feed these gear shift rods through. Actually, I like using the lower ones. They actually give you two holes on each one because this is like a universal bracket, but uh, I like using the lower hole. It just gives it a little better angle on the shifter. Oh, I'm inserting this wrong. I'm going to make myself a problem here. 
to get in here. Get around the right side of these cables. It's always good to show people how not to do it, right? So I'll bring this down and then slide this through the little plastic joint. And to back it up a little bit to get the washer on. The washers are just about useless. Really, it's the clip that holds it on there. So when you lose the washers, don't, don't sweat it. But if you lose a clip, you'll need to get another clip. You have plenty of that stuff at Earth Tools, but of course little clips like this just, can just be got at a hardware store too. Through. I typically orient these joints uh, to be on the far side of where the handlebars are oriented. So the, so the handlebars are oriented this way, I've got this joint swung around this side of the upright rod. Again, it's just, it's a very slight difference rather than being like this, but it, it changes the angle just incrementally and actually helps it shift slightly easier. So there's that. All right, there it is. All right, so now we're ready to shift gears. Now the other thing you might wanna do is take your beautiful green plastic shroud and install that. It just goes right on here. You kind of hook it in, there's a little hook right here hooks are on the bottom of that and then shut it down all the way. Makes it look nice and green, but if you didn't like the color for some reason, too bad because these are green too, sorry. But now it looks cool. And it's got the fancy little gorilla sticker on it, which is important. Um, so, uh, we test run all these machines here at Earth Tools. So the engines are fully oiled and the transmission has oil in it. If you want to check your oil anyway, that's probably a good idea. Um, so that would be done right here. There's an oil fill plug actually on each side of the engine. There's one on that side and one on this side. There's also drain plugs on both sides of the engine, one here and one directly opposite. The ones on this side of the engine that we're looking at are the easiest ones to get to because on this side, the cylinder and muffler kind of comes over and kind of obscures this area a lot more. So it's a lot harder to get to this drain plug down here. So you don't have to fool with that. Both drain plugs and fill plugs go into the same place. They both go into the crankcase. All these engines are universal engines. So they, they put drains and fills on both sides because in some applications, you might not be able to get to one side of the engine. On this one, you could, but it's easier on this side. Uh, the Honda engine has a drain and fill locations in the same place. Now the important thing when checking the oil is that the machine has to be level, which it obviously is not right now. It's all leaned back down on the floor like this. Normally if you put an implement on there, that's going to help because the implement is going to bring that side of the machine down and lever this side of the engine up. But I don't have an implement handy here, so we're just going to do the old fashioned way of holding the thing off the ground. And you want it to be level with the engine level. You check the oil and it should be right to the top of the filling hole, which it is. It is, uh, yeah, it's right there, right there. I didn't quite have it level, so it's right there, ready to run out the hole. That's where you want it. There is no dipstick on these things. The, the owner's manual for the engine, which is included with the tractor, will often reference a dipstick, but we actually remove the dipsticks because the dipsticks will cause trouble. Uh, we found this out over the years, many, many years of selling tractors like this. The dipsticks are real short. They're just a little plastic dipstick on the bottom of the cap. And we clip them off and throw them away because the way this engine is designed, the maximum fill level is filled till it runs out the hole. That is, you can't overfill it because if you put too much in, it'll just run out the hole. So with the engine level, fill it till it runs out the hole. The dipstick has like a little safe range on the bottom of it and then an unsafe range. Well, probably fine with the dipstick being there is if you're in the kind of borderline region between safe and unsafe and you figure, oh, I don't feel like going and getting my quart of oil and topping this thing off. And then you go run the thing on a 30 degree slope, you're gonna fry the engine because there's not enough oil to run on a seriously tilted angle. When it's at the safe range, like the low edge of the safe range on that dipstick, that means it's safe to run with the engine level. Uh, not safe to run at a maximum tilt, like mowing on a hillside or tilling real deep in the ground where the machine is all cocked back. So if you want to keep your engine, you know, we want to keep your engine running as long as possible. That's why we cut the dipstick off. So that way 
you will go and get oil and fill it until it runs out the hole, and you'll never be low on oil no matter what angle you get the tractor at. So that's what that's all about. Um, we have oil recommendations as well as fuel recommendations on our website, earthtools.com. You can go there, go to the, um, let's see, it's, it's titled Use, uh, it's, yeah, the Use and Maintenance page. Use, Repair, and Maintenance, I think is the name of the, the page. Anyway, it's got sections, uh, very, you know, various points you can click on. Uh, the first one, I think, is engine oil and then engine fuel. Click on those and read them. Uh, I'm not going to go into all the details here in the video, but you can read up on that on the website in terms of oil change intervals and types of oil and types of fuel and things like that. So, the, uh, let's see, what will we cover next? So your implement is going to plug on here at the quick coupling, and of course your implements are packaged separately. This is the locking pin that drops down to lock your quick coupling in place. So once you insert the implement in here, you just drop that down and it snaps into place. You want to make sure this drops fully. If this pin is not quite lined up with the little hole it needs to line up with in the implement mail that goes in here, obviously it's not going to lock down, so you'll lose your implement. So just make sure that when that snaps down, it's nice and firm and, and completely against the top surface. Like, If it wasn't down all the way, it would look like this. It would be floppy. That means the pin is not fully dropped. The pin has to come all the way down. Uh, we have videos on our website specific for using the quick coupling system and maintaining the quick coupling system and some kind of tips and hints about getting implements on and off because they are very tight when they're new. So review those quick coupling videos. They all reference a BCS tractor, but the quick coupling system works exactly the same on the Grillo. So uh, don't pay attention to the fact that it's not a Grillo you're looking at in those videos. Um, now, now, the tractors are filled with a little bit of fuel here at the shop. Uh, there's, after our test run, most of it is removed. There might be a little residual fuel in there, but you're going to have to put gas in there. Uh, 89 octane or better is what we recommend. You don't want to fill these tanks up completely to the top. You want to leave at least an inch of airspace in the top of these tanks because of these new EPA caps they have on these things. If you get too much gas up into these caps, it can actually screw up the venting element. So fill it up no more than an inch from the top and you're good. Uh, once you're ready to start the machine, the procedure is you've got a throttle control here. This is the engine throttle, throttle speed control. If you're starting the engine cold, it's best to move it off idle a little bit. You don't have to rev it all the way up, but just bring it up off idle a little bit. Uh, the choke on this engine is this gray knob here. This is the Yamaha engine. Now, the Honda engine also has a gray knob for a choke, except it works backwards. On the Yamaha, you push it this way to choke it. On the Honda, you actually push it this way to choke it. So if you're used to one, it kind of screws you up. But that's choke. There's a little emblem somewhere. To, yeah, right there. You can hardly see it at this angle, but there's a little emblem showing you which way to go. This is the fuel shutoff control. We ship all the tractors with the fuel shut off. That's, that's the off position right there. Now, on the Hondas, the fuel shutoff is kind of over here. It's right below the gray choke position, and it's got an on-off arrow on it, so you know which is going on. On the Yamaha, they don't give you an arrow. They just, it's just there, and you have to figure it out. Well, the way it works is, this is on, this is off, this is also off. So you got two offs and an on. On is straight down on the Yamaha. On the Honda, it's just a straight left and right, and it's very obvious because it's got a gas pump symbol on it, so you know which way to go. This lever over here is your throttle lever, so you're not going to be dealing with it here on the engine. It is worked remotely by the one on the, on the handle. Now, if this were a manual start engine, I would just turn on the fuel, choke it, and pull the pull start. Well, this is an electric start, so we have the luxury of turning the key. Now, the first thing you want to do when you get this is take one of the keys off. Both the Yamahas and the Honda electric start engines come with two keys. Separate them. That way you don't lose them both at once. you got to have one to lose later. We'll go ahead and fire this up. The tractor is automatically in neutral. Now, I know that the gear selector was in neutral anyway because I rolled it earlier, but 
The thing is, on the Grillo tractors, they have this active clutch system, which means this has to be pushed down in order to make the unit go. So whenever this thing is let go, the tractor is in neutral anyway, because it's like you've got your foot on the clutch in a, in a car. So I'm not worried about drive engaging. We're going to go ahead and crank this up. As soon as it starts, I'll turn off the chip. So there it is running. Obviously, this one has a little bit of gas in it. This little bit of uh, plastic wrap doesn't need to stay on there. So if I were to want to drive it now, I would put it in gear. I would just put it in second gear. And I would depress the clutch lever to make it go. In order to depress the clutch lever, you have to get this little safety release here a little bit. It, it's not much, I mean, it's just literally that hard, but it has to move down just enough that it unlocks the clutch lever. Otherwise, it doesn't go. So, we're gonna press that down, and I'm driving. If I want it to stop, I'll let go. Push. Now, obviously, there's nothing on the front of the machine, so I'm having to lift a lot of weight to get this engine off the ground. Typically, you'd never be using it this way. But this is just for demonstration. Now, if I want to back up, this is your forward reverse selector. Pull that back, and we'll depress the clutch, back up. In the same gear you were going forward in, I haven't changed the speed. This lever selects the speed, this one selects the direction. So, back to forward. Back to reverse. Now, if I want to go slower, I can put it in first gear. First, first gear reverse. First gear forward. Always disengage drive before shifting speeds or directions. Otherwise, you're going to hear funny grinding noises. Not too good for your gearbox. Put in third gear. Third gear is nice and fast. start tractor. Now on a manual start tractor you would always kill it with this. You just push this all the way down and it'll kill the engine. On an electric start tractor though that's a little hazardous in the sense that you might leave your key on. If you kill it up here with the throttle control on the handlebar and you leave your key on and you walk away for two or three days you're gonna come back to a dead battery. This has to be off. Now turning the key off also kills the engine. So on an electric start tractor, you're much better off to simply turn it off, make a habit of turning it off with the key. That makes sure that, not only is the engine dead, um, but you're not gonna have a dead battery because you've disabled the charging system by turning it off. Doesn't matter where you leave this thing. So, and also, it's my recommendation to go ahead and shut off the fuel after each use. That just kind of guarantees that it, even if you get some nasty fuel at a, you know, uh, just a rotten filling station or whatever that compromises your fuel system, if it's shut off, it can't flood over and actually flood the engine with gasoline. So, um, yeah, on for running. When you put it in the barn, shut it off. I don't care what kind of engine it is, if it's got a fuel shut off, you're better off turning it off when you're not using the machine. In fact, I'll just shut it off now. So, um, other controls, which there are plenty of, this one is your power takeoff engagement. Uh, that's what's gonna engage your implement. It pulls back towards the tractor for engaging. Uh, although I shouldn't, yeah, I shouldn't say that. <laughs> it moves toward the engine for engaging. When, when the handlebars are in this mode, in the front PTO mode, it's going to be pulling this lever, but obviously when the handlebars are turned around to the other side, it's gonna be pushing the lever. So we shouldn't say pushing or pulling, we should say move the lever toward the engine. That engages power away from the engine, releases or uh, disengages power. We know about the reverser, we check that out. These levers here are your independent steering brakes. The two squeeze levers are on the right hand hand grip here. So this one activates this wheel, or rather, I'm sorry, this one makes the tractor go this way and this one makes the tractor go this way. What these are is brakes. There's actual drum brakes on both sides of this thing and by engaging the brake, it slows down that wheel and that wheel will move faster. This, this is possible because this tractor has a differential in it. Any tractor with a differential and independent steering brakes means that you can brake with, or I'm sorry, you can steer with the brakes. So uh, that's a very handy feature, particularly on hillsides when you need extra control. 
uh, or any time. I mean, maneuvering the tractor with the brakes takes about 70, uh, 70 to 80 percent of the effort out of maneuvering the tractor. It's really a slick feature. Now, there's also a little parking brake feature on these. If you want to squeeze these all the way, this little latch pops up into there and holds them in the squeeze position as a parking brake. And then to release them, you simply squeeze the handle and it just drops out by gravity. Nice little feature. Um, this over here is the differential lock control. So the differential I just mentioned because that's what allows the steering brakes to work on this tractor. With the differential open, which is the mode it's normally in, power can be differentiated between the two wheels. That is one wheel can go faster and the other one slower or vice versa. And of course that lets your brakes do what they do in terms of steering. Uh, it also allows me to do things like turn the tractor around like this. You can see one wheel moves forward and the other backwards. But you couldn't do that if it didn't have a differential. Typically, the smaller tractors don't have a differential in them, which makes them cheaper to manufacture because the, I mean, the differential is a very expensive component. So the differential allows for easy maneuvering and all that, but if you lose traction with one of the wheels, the differential will just put all the power to that wheel and it'll just sit there and spin. So you have to have a differential lock on a tractor where you sometimes need all the traction you can get. So if one wheel starts spinning, you can pull this lever back and within half a revolution of the spinning wheel, clunk, it'll lock in the other wheel and they'll both start turning at the same rate of speed. That locks out your differential and makes it a solid axle machine. So now you've got a lot of pulling power, you've doubled your pulling power essentially, but guess what? It's now very hard to maneuver the machine because you can't roll one wheel independently of the other. Now, now that I've locked this, I'll go ahead and rotate the tractor. Sometimes it'll take, like I said, well, there it went, it's locked right there. Hear that, sque that squealing noise? That's the rubber squealing on the ground. So I'm having to drag this thing around. It's a lot of effort. You really don't want to have to do a lot of maneuvering with the differential lock. And of course, now that the differential's locked, the steering brakes are useless. They don't do anything because it can't slow down one wheel independent of the other. So when you're done, getting out of the hard situation you're in where you needed the extra traction, just flip the differential lock out, and then you're right back to a very maneuverable machine again. The differential lock and unlock is the only control you can use without having to disengage power at the clutch. For shifting this, shifting this, so this is your gear shift selector, your PTO selector, and your forward and reverse selector. For all those, for shifting any of those functions, you're going to be letting this clutch go first to disengage drive, then doing the shifting and re-engaging the clutch. This one, you can actually engage and disengage while the tractor's in motion. Okay, so we've covered all that. Last thing we haven't covered here is this. What does it do? This is your handlebar swivel control. So, when I push this down, it releases the handlebars to pivot it to the left or right. So I can walk off to the side of the machine, which is very handy when you're mowing near a brush patch or something like this and don't want to get torn up with thorns. Uh, when the handlebar is fully reversed around the other side, of course, that offset on that side allows you to not walk in the tilled path that you've made so you don't have to have footprints in your till, in your tilled ground. Now, um, this is a great time to go ahead and turn the handlebars around. So let's pretend we're going to mount a tiller to it or a harrow or something like that. So we want the handlebars on this side of the machine. So what you're going to do is you're going to pull these pins back off. Slide these gear levers up just to kind of get them out of the way temporarily. I'll set these down by the owner's manuals. Oh, you're also going to have owner's manuals. I forgot to mention that, but you'll have owner's manuals for the engine, implements, and tractor in with your tractor manual. Although I take that back, some of the implements have the manuals packaged with them separately. Anyway, back to this. So I've disengaged my shift levers. Now I'm going to push this release lever down. The same release lever you used for the offset is the same one you turn it all the way around with. So which way do I go? Well, Grillo has a limiting system, so if you try to go the wrong way, it just won't go. Uh, it only allows you to go one way. Now, I'm going to talk briefly about the forward and reverse system. I'm going to kind of interject it here into the handlebar system because it's, it's an integral part of it. The Grillo G110 has a smart reverse feature. This is the only Grillo tractor we sell currently here at Earth Tools that has this feature. This is your forward and reverse linkage down on the transmission here. When I pull this back, you can see that lever move. 
okay? It's being moved by this cable uh, remotely up at the handlebar. So just kind of pay attention to where this lever is now. Right now the handlebars are in the front PTO mode. This is in forward, that is it would make the machine go this way. And this lever is slanted toward the engine. Now we're going to watch what happens when, the, when I turn the handlebars around. You will see this entire reverse assembly invert itself. Now, when you're doing this, when you're turning the handles around, it's absolutely critical that you don't have the thing pulled back into reverse, which is what I just did. If this spring is all compressed and it's pulled back into reverse and you turn the handlebars around, you're going to screw things up in here. It has to be in the forward mode. So, bring this around. Watch this thing come over. You have to kind of watch your cables here to make sure nothing gets tangled up. I'm going to just flick these off to the side. Uh, there we go. This cable here, which is the forward and reverse cable, will need a little help. I'll have to bring it around here about halfway through and all the way around. Whoops, my shift is not all the way. All right. Now this whole forward and reverse assembly reversed itself. It flipped completely over. So now the normal position is still making the tractor go forward this way. That is forward up here, flipped forward, is still gonna be forward this way. And when you pull this back, it's gonna back up. So you don't have to use the control differently when you turn the handlebars around. Forward is always forward, reverse is always reverse. That's the smart reverse function. So, the, and like I say, the only way to screw that up is to have it pulled back when you turn the handlebars around. That will, that will, what it'll do is either stretch or break the cable right there because there's simply not enough throw for it to flip over. And you can, you, I mean, you can force it. You've got a lot of leverage with four, four or five feet of handlebar here to force that around. But my recommendation is if you're rotating around and you feel resistance, stop and look for something that might be wrong. You don't want to be pinching anything. Again, all these cables could get pinched. Uh, we're going to bring this around again. Another note I'm going to make here is that during the rotation, you probably didn't see because of the angle of the camera last time, but during the rotation, you want to keep this lever depressed the entire time. The reason for that is that the, the locking pin, which is right, it's housed in this tube right here. This angle is not conducive to this. This locking pin is right inside this thing. So this is the tube that houses the, the little locking pin. You can see the holes it drops into right there. One, two, three, those are offset holes. Well, as I rotate this, this locking pin comes right over the top of your gear shift decal. And if I was to release this lever up here and that spring-loaded pin were to drop down on top of there, it would scrape a nice semicircular mark right through the decal and just ruin it. And so I'm going to bring this around, about halfway around, I'm going to reach over here and bring this reverse cable around. There it is. Voila. So, but we want to go to front PTO mode, so we're going to turn it around back. Here it comes, bring this around, click like that. Now we just plug our gear shifts back in. Now when you go to the PTO shift, you'll say, hey, I can't connect this thing. Look, it, it won't go all the way in. What's this crazy bracket here? Well, that bracket is there to make you rotate this piece around. So you, what you would do is pull this up. It, it kind of locks down into place. Pull it up, rotate it around 180, and then drop it back down. Now you could put this back through like you should. I'm not going to put the pins back on it just because we're doing this real quick. But what that did, this little, this little piece having to be reversed, what it, what it did, the function of it is to change the location of this little lockout knob right here. So this lockout knob interfaces with this arm on your forward reverse lever so that when the handlebars are in this mode that they're in right now, which is the rear PTO mode, it is impossible to have your PTO engaged and the tractor in reverse simultaneously because guess what? You like your feet and you'd rather not have them chopped up by a tiller or a rotary plow. So when the handlebars are in this position, this thing is forcing you to activate this safety. When the handlebars rotate to the other side of the machine, you're no longer on the business end of the tractor, right? The implement's on this end, you're on that end. And in fact, now that the tractor is turned around, you have to move in this direction 
which is now forward, with the implement engaged. So this knob needs to go away. Hence, this turns around, knob is on the other side, doesn't interfere with the reverse. So right now, for example, if I were to engage the PTO and then pull the reverser back, we'll go ahead and watch what will happen right here. This, this lever is going to come up and it's going to push the PTO. Well, no, because I didn't have this connected. You actually got to have this connected for this to work. Clunk, knocks the PTO right out of gear. So it's doing what it should. But you got to have it engaged here. Otherwise, it'll just push this up. So that's what that is all about. Um, <clears throat> with all these rotating parts here that flip over, it's a good idea to spray them with some lubricant at least once a year. If you let it out, set it outside and you know get rusty and nasty, nothing's going to flow the way it should. So a little penetrating oil on the various pivot points every now and then is a good idea. Your transmission oil check is the red cap right there. Again, it should be checked with the tractor level, which it's not right now, but we'll just pull this out anyway. It just pulls straight up. There's just a little O-ring that seals it in there. And it should be, there's a, there's a line on there. Right now it looks over full because it's kind of tilted this way. There's a drain right here for the transmission. That big bolt right there. When you're ready to drain your transmission oil, you want to lean the machine back kind of as far as you can. Take the implement off if you can. Put a big block under the engine to get the most oil out of it. I would even put a, a block under this, this tire, like tilt it up toward the drain hole. Holds about two quarts of 80W90 gear oil. I think the manual recommends a GL5 gear oil. Uh, that should be changed in the transmission after probably 20 hours of use and then every year thereafter. And the engine oil should be changed for after about 10 hours of use and then every 40 or 50 hours thereafter. You always change it earlier in the beginning just for break-in procedures. But that's all covered in your manual and it's covered on our website. So we've covered all the controls and functions. Um, we have an air filter maintenance video on our website you can review that talks about air filter maintenance. We have an oil change video that walks through the oil change procedure. Uh, if, the, if you've got an electric start tractor and the battery goes dead, you can still start the thing manually because they have that manual starter on too, but you've got to have the key in the on position. If, not, you know, if you leave the key off or leave the key out of the machine, you'll never get it started. It's got to be in that on position where the tractor would normally run. So that doesn't hurt it at all. Uh, these engines still start pretty easy even without the electric start. And then of course, uh, coming back to this first control we talked about, this is your height adjustment lever. Uh, that's, that's something you'll, you'll get used to using with various implements. That is, when you're tilling, for example, you'll want to set that a little higher so that as the tiller sinks into the ground, you know, whoom, it sinks down into the ground, it's still a comfortable working height. But then at the end of the row, you can lower the handlebars really quick just by reaching down there and snapping that lever and lower the handlebars six or eight inches so that you can lift the tiller up out of the ground easier. This also goes for the rotary plow and the power harrow and any rear PTO implements. Um, just a little convenient feature. The fact that these handlebars have some play in them, they kind of wiggle around a little bit, there's nothing wrong with them. It's just because there's big rubber mounts down here where the handlebars mount to the top of the tractor. So that's your anti-vibration system. There's nothing wrong with the tractor. It's not falling apart. Um, still a good idea after a couple of years of service to go over the various bolts that hold things together and make sure nothing's vibrating apart. I mean, if you're putting the tractor through serious farming use, things just have to be maintained. Uh, we also have a cable maintenance video on our website for uh, cable lubrication. You can review that. And uh, I think that about does it for the G110. Thanks for your purchase and happy gardening.